All right, good morning, everyone. We will get started. I am Lauren Zuber, Director of Corporate and Community Engagement for MKM Architecture and Design. And I'm happy to welcome all of you to um, Swimming Upstream, Redefining Healthcare Through Non-Traditional Facilities. So this web webinar has been presented uh, and prepared in partnership with the Indiana Hospital Association. MKM Architecture and Design is a gold underwriter sponsor of the IHA, and we are thankful to present this together. Uh, the presentation will be followed by some Q&A time. Feel free to use the Q&A box to ask your questions at any time, but we will be saving those until the end. Um, so first, I will uh, introduce one of our speakers who will take you through everybody else. Uh, we have Jeremy Fortier, who is, directs planning, design, and construction for MedExcel leads the team of design and construction professionals and serves 20 hospitals and outpatient care facilities in 57 counties throughout central and southern Indiana. So Jeremy, take it away. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, I'm happy today to be able to introduce uh, my fellow speakers. Uh, we partner with MKM Architecture often in our work because they see the relationship between design, uh, health, and how it can improve our hospitals and our communities. So first off, Zachary Benedict is a principal at MKM and is considered a leading voice in the connections on people and places. Matt Sparling, also a principal at MKM, recently was honored with Indiana's Young Architect Award by the AIA. As we talk today about non-traditional facilities, I think the key thing to remember as we walk into this is experts need to understand that traditional healthcare models may not always work. Uh, our focus is changing today to population health and demand for patient care will be in different locations than we would traditionally think. Uh, how our models have impacts on our community is of growing importance and really how we integrate with new technologies with things like telemedicine uh, have impacts to our everyday design and downstream to our communities at large. So a couple of learning objectives that we wanted to cover uh, in this discussion are, one, we wanted to outline the factors that define social determinants of health and try to think through and explain the need for healthcare providers to consider what we'll call upstream solutions. Second is to present some research assessing the impact non-traditional care settings have had on population health management and community well-being. Third is to discuss some unique strategies some healthcare providers uh, are pursuing to broaden their capacity uh, and impact the communities they're serving. And then lastly, just to try to define some best practices for planning, design, and operation um, of some of these non-traditional settings. I think it's important when we do this to at least start with a thesis so we all have a similar framework to, to discuss uh, an idea that's broad. Um, so today we wanted to talk about the way in which we have designed and managed conventional healthcare facilities has been guided by reliance on downstream services. Uh, as our understanding of the connection between the built environment and community well-being continues to grow, there will be an influx in the number of non-traditional care settings aimed at providing effective care for people of all ages and abilities, uh, a trend that will forever shift the priorities governing how healthcare facilities are planned, designed, operated, and maybe even defined. So first, we wanted to talk about the social determinants of health. Uh, this is a quote from uh, Wendell Berry, uh, an essayist and poet from Kentucky. And he says, I believe that the community in its fullest sense, a place in all its creatures is the smallest unit of health. And to speak of the health of an isolated individual is a contradiction in terms. I think that's a really interesting way to, to kind of paraphrase this discussion. Um, health is contextual. And when we talk about facilities and or the built environment, what we're really talking about is the design and operation of context. You know, as architects, we're in the context business. So um, we think it's our responsibility to try to understand how those decisions around how the built environments managed and planned impacts the health and well being of the people they claim to serve. You'll hear the, the phrase social determinants of health uh, frequently. I think you're going to hear it more and more um, as we come out of the current pandemic. And one of the probably biggest takeaways of of that research is to try to understand that access to a quality physician or healthcare is a small fraction of the social determinants of health across a broad spectrum. The vast majority of those have something to do with the everyday decisions that do define our, our daily routine. 
so social economic concerns. And probably the most telling of that is all the zip code analysis data where um, I can get closer to understanding your average life expectancy if you tell me your zip code as opposed to your, your diet or exercise routine. Um, and I think that's indicative of just the power the built environment has uh, on our well-being and paints a sad but true picture of how much of this is contextual. One of the ways to look at it is to try to understand its impact on us across multiple variables. So um, this is a slide of the rise and decline of lead bowling in America, which I don't think is usually considered a, a high risk variable uh, when we're talking about community health. But what's interesting about this is I can show you a similar graph for almost any uh, social organization in America, and the graph has a similar curve. Somewhere in the early to mid 60s, our participation in these social groups peaked. Um, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, VFW, lead bowling, you name it. Um, and then around that same time, they started to plummet, uh, almost to being non-existent today. And what I really think that is, is a reflection of the fact that it was at the same time we were building communities that made participation in these social groups really cumbersome. Um, so our, our use and activity within them declined. What's interesting with that curve is a counter curve. So while this was happening, so was this. This is the rise of chronic disease in America, obesity, heart disease, you name it. Um, and it's, a, I think, a direct result of this isolation and us as a human species reacting to the communities that we are imposing on each other. Um, now, there's a lot of variables that fall into this category, so it's easy to confuse causation and correlation, but um, there's another big trend that uh, when we talk about community health, I don't think can be avoided, and, and that's the rate in which uh, our country is aging as a population uh, for a couple of reasons. One is just the assumption that we will be dealing, uh, moving forward with a frailer population, but also trying to understand the daily lives of those individuals, largely with which live with uh, one other person or by themselves. So trying to understand not only what really this means in terms of the demographic projections, but also how our current and future state of our communities is going to be able to protect and hopefully improve the health and well-being of these individuals, as well as other age groups. I think the assumption is that the senior care service industry will take care of a majority of that problem. It's likely not true. It's really not how they're set up. Uh, the scale of, of their organization isn't really set up to do that. Somewhere north, uh, south of 5% of everyone 65 and older in this country actually live in age-qualified housing. So it's a small, you know, minuscule fraction of the market. What we're really trying to understand when we look at those aging projections is not those that would be willing uh, to, uh, um, to participate in those services, but the other people, the 95% the that uh, have no desire to live in an age qualified community, uh, want to be part of an intergenerational neighborhood, uh, but need to do that in a way that it retains their independence uh, and, and personal health. And that becomes the challenge uh, for the communities, the challenge that I think. Uh, is an unsolvable problem without partnering with healthcare facilities. One of the reasons that's such an issue is because with this rapid influx of older adults, you're also seeing an epidemic of loneliness. And what we're finding more and more of is the, the real clinical outcomes of chronic loneliness. And I think that will likely be one of the more popular research tracks coming out of the pandemic is just really understanding what impact loneliness has on this. And, and that might be a separate webinar altogether, but really trying to understand that that is part of the care continuum. That needs to be part of the discussion when we're debating uh, and strategizing how we can enhance community health. Uh, because at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is ensure people's happiness. And really, I think in an economic and clinical term, um, Jonathan Haidt wrote a really interesting book uh, called The Happiness Hypothesis, where he offers this equation. So he says experienced happiness is really the, the culmination of three things. One is your biological set point. Some people are just genetically happier than others. Uh, but the other two are your life conditions and your voluntary activities, uh, both of which can be largely impacted by your community and the built environment that defines your everyday routine. So when you understand that and the role happiness plays in the reality and the perception uh, of our individual health, you really start to think through how place attachment, placemaking, and community development 
become an extension of the healthcare system, not a parallel concern. But if we're going to look at well-being, I think we have to make sure we're, we're all using the same uh, metric. So uh, Gallup Share Care uh, does a health well-being index uh, across the country uh, every, every year. And what they do is they, they put out these reports on the state of each state and some larger metropolitan areas. Um, the lighter the shade of the color here, the less well uh, that state is. You can see the Midwest. I know we're all sick of looking at maps over the last couple of weeks, but um, this one shows a, a really interesting correlation between uh, health and uh, location. Uh, that what I'd call the black hole of the unwell is usually affectionately referred to as the Midwest. Um, and it becomes an increasing concern because not only do we have a larger problem in some other states uh, here in Indiana specifically, um, we have less resources to deal with that. So we're going to have to start to get really innovative about how we're understanding, uh, defining, and solving this well-being problem. Gallup measures well-being across five indicators. Uh, purpose, liking what you do each day. Social well-being, having supportive relationships and love in your life. Uh, finance, uh, making your economic life to reduce stress and increase security. Fourth is community well-being, liking where you live, feeling safe, and having pride in your community. And the last one is actually physical well-being, having good health and energy to get things done. So the culmination of those five uh, metrics is really the, the, the more global picture uh, of well-being and, and how we have to look at it when we're starting to try to understand the synergies between community development and the operation of our, our healthcare systems. Uh, the title of this webinar came from this, there's this kind of infamous, I guess it's almost like an Aesop's fable, a story that's really popular with healthcare providers. Um, and it, it, it's called The Ogre in the River. And it's a story of these uh, three gentlemen walking along a river and they, they see a drowning child in the river. So the, the first person jumps in to save uh, the drowning child. And as he's struggling to fight, you know, kicking and screaming, they see another child coming floating down the river. So the second individual jumps in the river. Um, and as they're trying to save those two, they look upstream and they see more children floating down the river. So the second individual starts grabbing sticks to try to build a dam to catch as many kids as they can. And more kids are floating, more kids are floating and they start getting really panicky and frustrated. They look up on the riverbank to see the third friend and he's running up the river. And they scream, where are you going? Why are you abandoning us? And he says, I'm not abandoning you. I'm going upstream to see who's throwing the kids in the river. Uh, and that is, I think, where we're at right now. That, that first individual that jumps in uh, is in some ways an analogy for a physician. It's a point-to-point -point service. They're there to solve a specialized problem. They work best on an individual basis. And that second person's really there to represent the social service industry, um, where they're trying to help as many people as possible, but there's just not enough resources to go around. There's just not enough sticks. Uh, what communities really need is to have some uh, some innovative leadership that's willing to run upstream and start talking about the root cause of these problems in a much more global and systemic way. And that's where I think this, this uh, overlap between the healthcare system and municipal leadership really needs to, 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 to trend, especially here in the Midwest. So traditionally what we have seen is this downstream idea of healthcare's real responsibility should be down here when we're dealing with the reaction to health concerns. What we're discussing today is how can the lessons we've learned after decades of doing this really well, how can we transpose those lessons here more upstream when we're talking about community development, neighborhood uh, connectivity and placemaking, and really understanding that there are shared expertise that both sides would benefit from. But to do that, I think we may to make a concerted effort that uh, as a group, as a community, we are committed to understanding how upstream strategies can affect downstream results. So what we wanted to do here is go through some of the more innovative and non-traditional care settings that still I think the general public might associate with uh, a conventional healthcare system, but kind of walk through the benefits and typology of those, those facilities, uh, but also try to understand how those can now blur the boundaries between what is perceived as part of, quote unquote, the healthcare system uh, versus civic and municipal space. And, and that is really the, the, uh, the challenge here, is to try to understand how we can evolve these, these non-traditional care settings uh, and 
try as best we can to forecast where they're headed. Over the years, uh, healthcare systems have created a portfolio of mixed building types. Uh, and these unbundled care models largely grew out of a desire for operational efficiency and consumer choice. Uh, these models offer more flexibility to the consumer. But on the other hand, it left the healthcare systems leadership team asking what model types create the most inclusive care, serve evolving demographics, impact of each building by location, and how will the varying models types work together and collaborate? Uh, we're we're going to go briefly through and define a few of these models. Going from larger facilities to the smallest ones, uh, consequently more common uh, to more disruptive. So the first one would be micro hospitals, represent another evolutionary step in consumer direct healthcare delivery in the United States. Uh, it's estimated that 60 micro hospitals in the U.S. Uh, this is a type of facility that has gained popularity within the, probably the last five to 10 years and different from both the small critical access hospitals and the freestanding EDs. Uh, the micro hospital, usually they're around 15,000 to 50,000 square feet, uh, but include, the, uh, include a limit their service lines in the front end services. So it's more emergency rooms, primary care and specialists. Uh, these leave the traditional acute care hospitals offering as many service lines as possible where the micro hospitals then refer them to the acute cases to these larger partners. So Cushman and Wakefield uh, did an analysis uh, of the micro hospital trend and suggest that micro hospitals will likely see significant growth, uh, particularly in the states like Texas because uh, they require a certificate of need. These, no, they do not require a certificate of need. Uh, these states of asset may also represent a new delivery model for providing care in the markets uh, that cannot support a full-fledged short-term acute care hospital, but require more substantial healthcare services that can be delivered uh, in a freestanding ED department uh, or overnight patient stay. So freestanding EDs uh, is, is interesting uh, because they float between the micro hospitals and urgent care facilities. However, the reimbursements to these facility models deserve uh, a market analysis before deciding uh, the direction to go. According to the uh, 2009 study, which was a while ago, it, it's been on the rise in the last decade, up to 29% of the emergency room visits were unnecessary and could instead be handled by an urgent care clinic. So urgent cares, they're, they're normally around 3,500 to 4,000 square feet and are convenient on-demand care models, similar to a walk-in clinic, but they're equipped to handle more serious uh, elements rather than bronchitis or like a minor infection. Uh, these areas care into more fractures and sprains and wounds and stitchings and x-rays. Uh, the urgent cares are the first step in the patient's journey of potential referrals or follow-up appointments. Uh, a newer uh, mock uh, uh, evolution, uh, evolution of models is a pace center. Uh, delivering all needed medical and supportive services, a pace center, which is programs of all-inclusive care for the elderly, which PACE stands for, provides the entire continuum of care and services within a roughly a 12,000 square foot building and usually can serve about 120 to 150 participants. Uh, this, the easiest way to describe this is more like a membership uh, that people would belong to within the community. Uh, so what their services that they provide would be like adult daycare, physical and occupational and recreational therapies, uh, meals and nutritional counseling, social work, uh, uh, home health care, personal care, uh, necessary prescription drugs and social services. Uh, they also uh, uh, help with uh, uh, medical specialties like dentistry and optometry podiatry, speech therapy. Uh, so there's a lot of things that this model does to help be more preventative uh, and proactive before a person of the community has to go into a more acute care environment. Uh, another uh, evolving model is more like civic areas or uh, wellness centers. Uh, wellness centers are evolving uh, more and more. Uh, recently, we know that Evansville uh, and St. Vincent's, uh, Ascension St. Vincent and Evansville at the YMCA uh, had a collaboration where they had a uh, diabetes out outreach program. 
this, since this program opened up, members have seen an average weight loss of 7.1% with an average activity of 140 minutes per week. Uh, the Indiana State Department of Health uh, was also on board with this idea and have been providing marketing support and increasing referrals as well. Uh, and the program is staffed by Ascension Medical Group employees. So this is where you're going upstream and getting out into the community to help uh, prevent uh, acute care visits. Uh, another uh, model that you see a lot is retail clinics. Uh, they're roughly, they're very small, 400, 600 square feet, uh, usually just a reception desk. You're lucky if there's a chair, maybe one exam room. Uh, retail clinics are located in pharmacies and grocery stores. Uh, patients visit this area when the urgent cares and primary cares aren't open. That's when most of these get visited. Uh, they're very limited in range of health conditions in which they can treat. Uh, so it's like minor infection, vaccines, uh, anything that's preventative care. So uh, usually the care at these locations are delivered by a nurse, practi nurse practitioner or a physician assistant. Uh, prices here are usually fixed uh, and transparent. Uh, one interesting thing about the clinic on uh, the next slide here is the Athena Health did a comparison between primary care clinics and retail clinics. Uh, the average check-in time and average wait time, which is the bottom blue part of the graph, uh, are pretty comparable to one another. However, if you look at the average exam time, which is in red, and the sign-off time and checkout time, which is the top portion, are drastically different. Uh, the average exam time is three times as long as what it is in a primary care location uh, than in a retail clinic. And the checkout process is about four times as long as a primary care versus a retail clinic. Uh, the retail clinic uh, visits are usually completed around 30 minutes, where primary care is completed about 80 minutes. So if the uh, community is looking more about convenience and time, uh, and of course, they do want to still get quality care. That's a big difference of a 50-minute um, uh, wait time or visit. So a third of the retail clinic users have a primary care physician when they visit. So there's still a third going out to the clinics. Uh, two thirds of the retail clinics visits were paid by health insurance, where 90% of the primary care were paid by insurance company. Uh, about 90% of the visits to the retail clinic were for preventative care only. I think it's interesting to point out here too that as technology evolves, the amount of space needed can reduce because a lot of the retail clinics are checking you in on an app. So your waiting room is your home or your car uh, as you're approaching one of these clinics. Uh, another one as a example is the little clinic. Uh, we noticed it's a pioneer in customer focused healthcare with a mission to help people live healthier lives. Uh, when you have an urgent health concern, the little clinic offers easy care access. So they, their board certified nurse practitioners and their physician assistants provide high quality affordable healthcare uh, located in your neighborhood grocery store. The little clinic uh, treats, this little clinic treats about uh, patients 12, 12 months and, uh, and in Kentucky they go up to 24 months of age. They'll treat anybody older than that. Um, the 12 locations in Indiana are staffed by Kroger employees themselves. Uh, they have a concierge service that is uh, direct patients to relevant specialists. So they, they help guide you to which healthcare system and uh, specialties they offer. So in 12 months, they scheduled 50,000 referrals in 12 months. Uh, and they've already uh, shown the ability to reduce a seven day readmittance to the ED. Uh, so this so far has been a very well modeled uh, for multiple healthcare systems and referrals. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about COVID-19 because I know some people want to know a little bit more about what we think is coming out of that, but in the upcoming slides, we'll talk about that. But one of the very recent evolving care models in 2020 was a drive-through service. Uh, this service has demonstrated to communities that services can happen outside the walls of the facility. Uh, this concierge approach is not only safer during a, a pandemic, but also it provides a level of convenience that can possibly impact the willingness to participate. So once the community now sees the benefit of a drive through service, the demand will probably always be there now. Uh, so the future wallless strategies will be more likely to evolve 
uh, encourage participation and preventative, preventative me measures in the community. So with those kind of in our wheelhouse of at least existing facility types within a lot of uh, healthcare providers portfolio, uh, we also wanna talk about how the environment and culture that, that those uh, services can impose on a community or provide a, a neighborhood really can shape and uh, change the trajectory of community health and well-being um, across the state. One of the things that I think is important, though, is to understand that there's two really key strategies here at play. Is the first is trying to understand how you can effectively provide healthcare. The second is trying to understand how you can effectively convince people to use it. Um, and sometimes those are at odds with one another. And that, I think, especially in a rural context, is really the bigger problem to solve. Uh, one of the things that I think the COVID pandemic has done is it has really fast forwarded some of these projections, uh, maybe as much as 10 years. Um, this was a, a chart here on the access and usage of telemedicine uh, compared to physical visits to a physician's office or clinic. And you can see that they were projecting that somewhere in 2024, uh, the virtual would actually surpass the physical. Um, the disruptive changes we've made during the, the pandemic, I think, um, has really made leaps and bounds to understanding how patients can access their physicians through telehealth, um, which isn't a bad thing at all, but it's really changed, I think, how we think of the facility uh, and reshaped, I, I think, the, the, the user's um, opinion on what convenience looks and feels like. So as we continue to understand uh, how telehealth will change the facility itself, we also have to understand how it could and will change the shape uh, of our communities. The other one, especially in rural settings that we have to come to grips with is the, the shrinking care networks. So since 2010, 82 rural hospitals have closed nationwide, but as many as 700 are at risk to closing and that number continues to grow post pandemic. Uh, and there's simply just not enough patients with good insurance to keep a hospital from losing money. And it's become a continual concern uh, throughout the Midwest. So accessing the care is disappearing and the reactions to phenomena, phenomena such as the OIPO epidemic or the COVID pandemic are falling in the hands of community members, not healthcare professionals. So we have to figure out how we can provide innovative ways to bridge this gap. The other thing that I think has come out of the pandemic is uh, what I can only hope is a growing interest in understanding how we can cross cultivate the expertise on the healthcare facility side with the management and operation of civic space uh, and understanding that not only are we going to be charged as design professionals to be more educated and uh, experienced in understanding how we can provide more pandemic proof buildings, which is a phrase I just made up, um, or um, understanding how the operation of these buildings uh, can understand and leverage uh, the, the longstanding knowledge of healthcare facilities uh, in uh, social settings like a restaurant or a public library. Um, everything from infection control to transportation, we're going to have to start to rethink in an upstream mentality how we can better leverage this expertise and let it uh, benefit things outside the walls of conventional healthcare facilities. One of the ways to look at it is to try to understand how we can build that. And I think it needs to be uh, and something that we, we would call a, a multi-channel or an omni-channel uh, reality. And what that really means at the, at the base of it is, if we want healthy people, we need to figure out how to design, manage, and operate a healthy community. Um, we can't approach it the other way around. And to do that is going to take a series of diverse and multifaceted professionals that understand that we're in this together and that our success relies on their success. Um, this is the example I think depicts that. I've seen this in person occur three or four times in the last decade. Um, and in one case, I actually met the individual in the photo who admitted that he does this every morning before he goes to the gym to exercise. And I think it's a really telling way to show and illustrate the connection between design and behavior. You know, the reason that that dog is being driven down the road 
is partly because that, that road has no sidewalks, no street lighting, no signage, no furniture, no people. Uh, in that way, the only activity on that street was designed around the behavior of a car. So it's in some way designed to, to drive a dog down. And we have to, as designers and planners, understand that the decisions we make in the design and planning process really do impact and in some ways dictate the behavior of the users. Um, and so when we're going and talking about community health in, in this way, we have to understand and reconcile the fact that our decisions really do in some way impose some of these results. In marketing and retail spaces, you'll hear a lot about multi-channel or omni-channel uh, networks or services. And I think that's applicable to, to health and well-being. Um, for so long, we, we treated healthcare as a multi-channel thing. If, um, if you needed help with a certain problem, you went to this facility, or if you needed to talk to a specific physician, you went to this location. And we even had a hard time with those physicians talking to one another. Uh, not only are we getting more sophisticated in how we're sharing information regarding the patient's history, but from an omni-channel standpoint, we're also trying to get a better understanding of, of how all these services, experiences, and expertise can work together within the healthcare system and beyond the healthcare system, and trying to understand how this isn't as much about channels as it is much about networks, relying on each other and the built environment to ensure some level of community health and well-being. The example I'll give is uh, the OXO potato peeler. Um, it was designed originally uh, for the grandmother of a lead designer at a, uh, at a firm for an arthritic hand. But to OXO's credit, they don't market this as geriatric kitchen utensil. It's just a really well-designed potato peeler. And that's how we have to think about our communities moving forward. Um, we need to understand that it could be better, it could be more inclusive, and we don't need to do it in such a way that we're asking for credit or a pat on the back uh, for thinking through some of these concerns. Uh, we need to understand the science that needs to be embedded in a lot of these decisions, both from products to places. But to do that, to understand all the variables at play that would make this a more inclusive product that would create a longer usage for a wider variety of users, you're going to have to accept the fact that we need to tap expertise outside the normal resources and start leaning on people that have long experience operating and managing healthcare facilities if we're serious about solving a healthcare problem. Uh, you're seeing uh, a lot of recent trends in this very thing. Project for Public Spaces, who's I think probably one of the more go-to uh, resources for understanding uh, effective placemaking released a few years ago their uh, case for healthy places and in it talk about how specific types of civic spaces can increase well-being. Uh, it also had a small chapter in there and how you can engage hospitals in that planning. Uh, it was the first example that we saw of, of someone trying to really compare and reconcile the fact that healthy placemaking needs to include uh, the healthcare sector. You're also seeing a lot of interesting movement and research in the longevity space. So people like the Blue Zones effort or AARP are really trying to understand and define what the optimal living condition is for an older adult. Um, and what I think is interesting about that is it, it would likely be the exact same scenario and strategy for a pre-driving teen. Um, these aren't strategies that are necessarily tied to uh, the success of an older adult but there's a lot more interest in that for obvious reasons. They're a voting pool, they have disposable income, but when you talk about the strategy for the built environment, they're very similar. Um, Blue Zone has a, a, a platform called a life radius, where it talks about the things that you need within walking distance to increase your longevity, uh, as well as what they call the power of nine, where they, think, they say all good uh, places need to provide these nine things uh, to uh, your neighbors to ensure that they'll live a long and full life. So trying to reconcile these things, I think is becoming increasingly important and it will be extremely important as we move out of uh, the pandemic. One of the ways to do this, and I would argue maybe the most successful is to understand uh, three basic types of places within any community. So uh, one is home, uh, one is work, and the third is like the cheer song where everybody knows your name. It's that social hub. So in some ways you think about it as three different types of realms. Home is a realm of privacy. 
work, uh, whether it's paid or volunteer, is a realm of purpose. And hub is that realm of fellowship. And research study after research study indicates that we need all three places within our daily routine. And it works best when they're unique and separate from one another. So trying to understand that and the healthcare facility's role in that becomes increasingly important. Um, one way to look at it is to think of a hospital, especially in a rural setting, as a third place. For instance, uh, it's amazing to me, but it's been consistent over my career that uh, every rural hospital has a good reputation for, for, as a restaurant, providing good food. Um, but don't think of themselves necessarily as a third place, as a social hub, as a place that you would go without a doctor's appointment. Uh, but that's how they're used in a lot of cases. So understanding that brand and that identity within the community shapes and changes your perspective as opposed to having a hospital lobby. What if it looked like in this photo as a restaurant, as a social hub, as a third place that invited people to come in, whether or not they had any business upstairs with a doctor. And what that does is it really transforms people's perception and opinion and experience within the building uh, so that they don't only come to these buildings when they feel uh, sick. They're coming here for different reasons and they are questioning really what the role of the library or the hospital is and understanding what role it can play in the future of the community. A more uh, dramatic example of this is what they call Matters More Than a Cafe, which was a, a essentially is a, is a senior center disguised as a Starbucks, uh, founded and operated by Mathers Lifeway Foundation. And the interesting thing here is, um, how purposeful they were in its operation. So staff's giving a list of words are not allowed to say like senior, they have to call them people. And that stigma, removing that entirely is really interesting because what it does is it allows the user group to feel as part of an intergenerational neighborhood and not necessarily one that is in need of or dependent upon a set of services. Um, and understanding that and the role third places can play, this is as much of a healthcare facility uh, as the hospital lobby slide previously. Um, but the way it's handled, it's marketing, branding, and staffing is much different. Um, and only about half of the patrons they serve are older adults, which provides, again, a, a more intergenerational and realistic depiction of the neighborhood that they're serving. So when you start thinking about those third places, then you start to think, well, how many opportunities do we have uh, to provide this kind of platform within the healthcare continuum? And my favorite example that I think is under leveraged is public libraries. Uh, this country has more public libraries than it has McDonald's. So to think about that as an asset, a municipal asset that all provides a democratic space that we can leverage uh, in a meaningful way to increase community health and well-being, I think is a really exciting uh, opportunity for the Midwest. And in some ways, it's how the libraries are being used now. Um, the vast majority of internet usage in library has something to do with individual health and well-being. People are going there to search. Uh, uh, or access services online. Um, and libraries are starting to understand that role. They're also burdened with uh, a large responsibility of people that are either uninsured or unwilling to engage the, the formal healthcare system in a meaningful way. So you're seeing more and more librarians get trained to understand and identify uh, uh, opioid overdoses, uh, COVID symptoms. They are in fact becoming de facto public health uh, officials. And we need to flip that around and try to understand how we can help them become one of those first lines of defense and understanding and articulating the current uh, health of the communities that we're serving. Uh, and in fact, uh, last year, the Philadelphia Free Library uh, actually transitioned one of their branches into what they called um, the South Philadelphia Community Health and Literacy Center. And really it's, what they did is they took some underutilized square footage within the building and turned it into uh, a clinic that in partnership with a local hospital was providing preventative care. Uh, and what they found is that the usage of that preventative care exponentially increased. And I think largely because uh, the, the, the logo, the branding of the hospital wasn't uh, apparent. So it didn't feel as though uh, you were engaging in formal clinical services. Uh, surveys uh, from users claimed that they were much more confident that they weren't going to get uh, uh, charged for these quote unquote free services. Uh, and I think just the stigma of, of doing this in a more public setting with a much more forgiving brand like the library has it is a much more approachable offering 
to some of these free services than they would be if we said we're going to offer them in the hospital lobby. Um, and, and that I think is the really exciting thing is to try to understand what partners, uh, both logical and maybe more non-traditional, can help us move the access to healthcare and the discussion and dedication to a healthy community outside of just the formal walls of the healthcare system itself. So I think it, there's really four key things that we need to think about when we're talking about the evolution of healthcare facility design and planning. One is we, we need to, as a collective group, understand the, the social determinants of health and their impact on facility design, planning, and operations, especially as it relates to the social economic demographic projections. We need to understand how and in what ways our communities are changing over the next 20 years. I also think we need to look a little harder to, to choose innovative partners to help redefine how our organizations are engaging, uh, both existing and potential users and patients, as well as communities uh, that understand the importance of healthy living for the community at large, uh, for people of all ages and all abilities. Uh, the third is to try to diversify the user experience by leveraging different building types and operational models to provide an array of different points of service, kind of the omni-channel uh, experience uh, for a growing mix of customers and patients. Uh, and trying to do this in a way that's accessible to a much larger audience than it currently is, both physically and psychologically. And the last one is we, we need to understand how, especially at a local level, we can think more upstream when possible and consider how the strategic decisions of our organizations can proactively impact the health and well-being of the communities we serve in a much more strategic and cooperative way. So with that, we will open it up to questions. And we already have a couple of questions. Um, first up, and this popped up when you were talking about kind of library, those third place spaces, would there be concerns with health and safety if the lobby were a public space? I imagine some would have concerns with viral and germ transmission. Well, yeah, no, I think there is. And I, this is one that, you know, now in full disclaimer, uh, MKM does a lot of public library work too. Um, it is a growing concern. Uh, all the more reason I think that we need to cross cultivate some of this expertise. Um, I think you're going to see more public libraries reaching out to people like healthcare architects or healthcare facilities operators to understand how they can make their lobbies safer. Um, that's different than saying no one's allowed to come to the public library. Um, and that's where I think we have missed the boat a little is um, for so long we have been so reactive and protective that we haven't done a good job of educating, uh, especially non-traditional care settings on how they can maneuver uh, through something like uh, a flu season, not to mention a pandemic. So I, I do think there's gonna be more and more strategies. And um, I even think that there's a possibility that a similar effort from a building code standpoint to ADA for accessibility is going to start to, to be proposed for infection control. Um, but the only way we're going to get there is to have these discussions and understand that every public space, uh, interior and exterior, is an extension of the healthcare system. And these healthcare systems have gone through, I mean, years of uh, infection policies and procedures and writing things up to protect their patients, their staff. So they've lived this for years. Now the question is, how do we educate other people on what they've learned over the past I don't know, 50 years of infection control in general? So. Excellent. Um, we'll jump over to another question. In what ways have the existing design of medical spaces failed to address the reality of current trends in population, technology, pandemics, et cetera? I think I can start to answer that just by talking about where we physically locate some facilities. And as we're talking today about non-traditional models, you think about how we're moving our care into our communities. So when we talk about our freestanding emergency departments, that those are located uh, in geographic areas that may not have any kind of services there. So you can start by actually getting services to the patients. And I think we've failed in some of the things like preparing for technology. Uh, not everybody has the same crystal ball, so we've taken a lot of guesses in how telemedicine would look. Uh, and certainly, uh, as much as we learned in the pandemic about Zoom and Teams and things like that, I think we underutilize that technology uh, going into our current state. Uh, 
Excellent. Uh, and what are your thoughts on combining spaces like ProMedica does in Ohio with their combination grocery store and educational training facility? I don't know if I'm familiar with that one, but I, I do think um, a large part of the the psychological barrier of people not willing to uh, take advantage of, especially preventative care, is is a branding problem. And uh, it's one of the reasons I think the little clinic's effective, I think public libraries are critical, is um, there is, I think, a stigma sometimes around things that are solely branded and marketing as uh, a hospital. Uh, you know, that's for sick people, I'm not sick. Uh, or I don't have insurance and you're gonna send me a bill. So any creative partnership, I think, where we can start to challenge that assumption and redefine what that feels like to the average consumer, um, I, I think research will show that that's a, that's a benefit to the community at, at large. Um, the next question is trying to access them in the most meaningful ways. Um, you know, we did a research project a couple of years ago, which I'm guessing is still true. The average Hoosier lives more than six miles away from toilet paper. Um, that's a problem. You know, that's a, that's a real, it's, it's a silly example of a real problem. Um, it also highlights, I think, the fact that there's likely in those communities only one place to get a lot of things. So in this discussion, you would be silly not to have a healthcare presence at that location in some way, shape, or form. Um, and, and that is the discussion I think we need to start having. In some communities, that'll be different. You know, I, in some places, it'll be a big box retail. In other places, it will be a library. Um, so I don't know if you need to be prescriptive about what the partnership is as much as understanding where people are leveraging their time and their resources and trying to meet them in the middle. And I'm thankful some of these evolving care models have already started because when the pandemic hit, the emergency room uh, volumes dropped drastically. So if we didn't have some of those areas plugged out in the community, you would have zero access to any kind of preventative care. Uh, so. I'm glad there were things out there at the beginning. Now the question is doing that market analysis to see where else we can plug in those different care models. Excellent. Uh, how has the pandemic changed capital allocation and priorities for healthcare systems? I think I can flag that. You can imagine the, the amount of capital that's out there was dedicated heavily to pandemic response. And also things along the lines of uh, elective surgeries and things that were just outright canceled for health and safety uh, have changed where capital has come from and what it can be used for. Uh, I think one of the enlightening things that we found as we've come through the pandemic is it still costs money to keep the lights on even if you've got no patients. So we've really started to refocus some of our capital into the things we've talked about today like telemedicine and focusing on getting out into the communities but also have revived some of our programs that maybe got less, uh, less press lately, like environmental stewardship and, and energy conservation. Because if you think about how many dollars of, of healthcare it might cost in order to keep the lights on, well, if you change the light to an LED, that changes the model pretty significantly. So a lot of our capital has gone into, uh, again, location, 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 and then energy conservation and how we can embrace technology and set up flexible spaces for the future. Uh, so you've probably heard a lot about modular, but less so modular as more as uh, the ability to change. So when you think about things like hard walls and barriers for exam rooms, if you need to change the size of a room, we can think a lot more about a mobile partition uh, than we can about your traditional uh, drywall kind of wall. Excellent. Uh, so much public infrastructure, especially new residential neighborhoods, is built by private developers. In the conservative Midwest, where keeping new product affordable is such a priority, how do you convince developers, government officials, and the marketplace that spending more on infrastructure to create a healthier community should receive more resources? It seems the relationship between health-promoting infrastructure and actual health is a distant one for people right now. That's a great question. Um, two things, I think, uh, immediately. One is, I think, especially in states that understand and legitimize the fact that they're behind the ball here in terms of health and well-being, need to redefine development subsidies and incentives in a way that helps safeguard us against this. Um, I, 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 th I think that's going to be a growing uh, 
strategy, whether or not it's adopted in this state or region, uh, I don't know. But I mean, for example, understanding that a tax abatement comes with the provision of certain amenities to assure that residents can have uh, everyday goods and services within a 10 minute walk. That's not a requirement to development, but it is the carrot that comes with the incentive. Um, I, I sincerely think that that is the next iteration of public zoning uh, and trying to understand how we can nudge that behavior as opposed to uh, requiring it. The other one is I think you're starting to see much more sophistication to market demand research. Uh, you know, the biggest problem we have in the, the development is always trying to understand uh, the, the financing of a large project like that. And for years, market catchment was defined by putting a pin on a map and counting people within 25 miles. And now what we're finding is there's so much willingness to migrate to communities based on quality of life that that market area is much, much bigger and your potential of attracting certain demographics is much, much larger, but you have to understand how to attract them and uh, where they might come from. So in that scenario, the cohort's usually called an amenity seeking migrant, which is a horribly cold an academic phrase for someone that wants to move somewhere based on what it would be like to live there as opposed to a specific job. Um, there's, a, and I won't get into it right now, but there's so many other benefits to that cohort. They're usually off the chart, happy people. Uh, they have a much higher propensity to volunteer in the local community and so on and so on. Um, and the, the, the financial benefit of the in-migration of those types of individuals I think is gonna to start to become part of the capital stack and the way communities define whether or not a project's worth subsidizing. You saw it for a brief moment in Indiana when we did the regional cities projects based on quality of place. I think it's gonna be within that framework, but with a more hopefully sophisticated look at health and well-being. Excellent. Up from the poster, I personally have had to overcome the notion of receiving a flu shot at a drugstore and for free too, as valid as I've always received immunizations from the doctor's office. There are healthcare paradigms at work here. How can these be overcome so that people know that these less traditional healthcare facilities are actually easier to access than traditional facilities? Uh, you, you can drop millions of dollars on marketing research. It, it won't work nearly as well as uh, a friend telling you to do it. Yeah. Um, and, and that is what I think healthcare systems have traditionally misunderstood is, is that the most reliable way to spread anything through a community is through gossip and hearsay. And that's why third places are so effective. It's why Facebook's um, so important right now, whether you like it or not, um, because it's an extension of that friend to friend communication. Uh, so when we talk about third places, the thing that I think is important to remember, and again, um, hard to uh, leverage, is the design of the third place. And take this coming from an architect. The design of a third place isn't nearly as important as the behavior of the operator, right? Uh, a good bartender will sell more beer than a really well-designed bar, right? The good designed bar will have a really interesting popularity when it opens and then it fades. A good bartender can run a dive joint and make a killing if they if they treat customers a certain way. And that management style, that behavior is something that you can add resources to. Um, we have sent our librarian clients to Mathers Cafe training. To understand how they run that. Cafe has nothing to do with the library, but it doesn't matter in that context. What you really need to do is understand how you can get someone to be a really effective third place operator. And that's what resonates with people. That's what will get someone to say, I know you can go to the hospital to get such and such service, but you should just go down there and my guy, gal, whatever, that runs the such and such place will, will take care of you. That goes uh, much more effectively and spreads much more quickly than uh, a commercial or a PSA. Excellent. And we got a comment from that question asker that love that answer. Ironically, the best way to spread disease is also through word of mouth. 
<laughs> yes. And yes, then sure. we have uh, one final comment that I think will, if you know, your response will take us to the end of this. So, uh, realizing that the pandemic created a dilemma for hospitals and healthcare providers, but many parts of healthcare are still shut down, like doctor visits for healthcare issues other than COVID. Uh, it's hard to do a virtual visit for cardiac care or a sinus infection. A great question, and I think I think there's a lot of layers to that, but. On the surface, I think it's another technology question. Uh, think about what, what probably many of the people listening today have on their wrist, right? We're, we're talking about smartwatches and technology that you carry with you. Uh, for, a, for a few years now, sleep studies have been transferred from inpatient facilities to uh, bringing a monitor home and dropping it off in a box. Uh, I don't know that we're, we're ready for some of those higher acuity things to be done at, at home or virtually. But I think the technology will bring us there. So when we think about heart care or even endocrinology, things like diabetes, uh, there's ways to monitor sugars and monitor you know, heart rhythms uh, that are all mobile that can lend themselves to those virtual visits. So I think it's going to be definitely an evolving, uh, an evolving care paradigm where we figure out what works and what doesn't uh, as we move forward. And those virtual cares, a lot will be them ruling things out and then decide if you need an in-person that's a great point. So it'll be like, oh, you don't have this, you don't have that, can't be this, but you, you should come in. Uh, it, it, I mean, that's, you're ruling out the not. Excellent. Well, we are closing in on our hour and have wrapped up um, all the pending questions. So thank you, Zach, Jeremy, and Matt for sharing all of this knowledge and your time answering questions and presenting this. Uh, and thank you everyone, um, all of our participants. We're glad that you could take the time to learn about upstream thinking with us today. Um, please, if you have any follow-up questions or would like to speak to us deeper, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, we're happy to be a resource for everyone. So have an excellent day. Uh, I hope you enjoy some sunshine and get out there before things get too cold. <laughs>